Hare Krishna. Welcome to our discussion on the Bhagavad Gita. We are now in the middle of the Bhagavad Gita, ninth chapter. And in some ways, we have completed half of the journey. And the Bhagavad Gita is in the ninth chapter focusing very much on the principle of devotion. So today we will discuss the principle of sonic glorification of the Lord through the chanting of mantras. So our topic is what are mantras and how does uttering them repeatedly make us spiritual? We'll discuss based on 914 in the Bhagavad Gita. Satatam kirta yantomam itantascha drudavrataha namasyantascha maam bhaktya nitya yukta upasate. So, satatam kirta yantomam, those who always glorify me. Itantascha drudavrataha, endeavoring with great determination. Namasyantascha maam bhaktya. They offer their obeisances to me with devotion, bhaktya, nitya yukta upasate, and this way they constantly worship me. Here Krishna is talking about the primary mode through which devotion is expressed, and that is through glorification, kirtayanto. And then he gives further descriptions of how that glorification is done. It one is it requires endeavor with determination. It requires a mood of reverence. Namasyantasya. It requires consistency. Nitya yukta. And of course, it is devotional. So now we will discuss these aspects of glorification of the Lord, which is a way of connecting with Him, especially in the context of mantra chanting. So I'll talk about mantras in three parts. So, what, what exactly do what mantras, what do mantras do? They, they are said to awaken us. So, how do they awaken us? We'll discuss in terms of the states of consciousness. Then when we talk about mantras, now where exactly does their power lie? That will be the second aspect. And then, after that, We'll discuss how does mantra chanting spiritualize us? How does it lead to a spiritual consciousness? So now, one of the, the first point, one of the common motives in spiritual traditions is the chanting of mantras. So what exactly are mantras? So there are different ways of understanding it. One way understanding is that mantras are spiritual power contained in sound. So now this is not a precise understanding, it is an approximate understanding. The word mantra literally means mana trayate, that which frees the mind, frees it from impurity, frees it from negativity, frees it from contaminations within itself. So now how does that happen? Because in the mantras, there is spiritual power contained in the sound. Another way of understanding is that the mantras are sonic packets of divine energy. So each mantra is a packet. And that packet, it is just like we can have different kinds of packaging. If we are getting medicine, uh, it might be packaged in, in uh, sometimes in a glass container, sometimes in a plastic container, sometimes in a... <clears throat> In a, in a paper foil, different ways. So then this is a sonic packet. And what does the sonic packet contain? It contains divine energy. So divine energy, the second definition is from a more personal perspective. It's divine. The second, first definition is more from a, often a more non-personal perspective. It's the focus is on the power, not on the divinity. But either way, from whichever perspective we approach it, the personal or the non-personal, 
the idea is mantra chant when we utter mantras what are we doing it is sonic meditation sonic is the adjective for sound and sonic meditation essentially is meditation on sound but not just on any sound it is on a specific sound so what is the characteristic of that sound now sonic power if you want to understand this every morning we can experience it if we use alarm to wake up we are you now when we are asleep we are at a place but we are not at that place we are maybe physically lying on our bed but we are in a sense not there because you're not aware of anything we are in dreamland and suddenly the alarm goes and then we we wake up we fumble and try to find the alarm and either we wake up or we put the snooze button with the snooze but either way what happens is suddenly our consciousness is transported from some other world from the dreamland to the world where we are in physically so this is sonic power and just as the alarm the sound of the alarm can awaken us physically one of the common motifs in the spiritual literature is that we are all asleep spiritually upanishad say uttishtata jagrata prapya varam nibodhata uttishtata arise arise awaken jagrata jagrata uttishta is like a physical arising jagrata is like more like a awakening and tishta jagrata prapya varam nibodhata attain your destiny attain what you are meant to attain what is that we are meant to attain that is to fulfill our potential to attain life eternal so this is the power of sound to awaken us spiritually now how exactly does sound awaken us spiritually for this let's look at this diagram to understand various levels of consciousness or we get more more precisely various states of consciousness so at the center you see this that is the soul the soul is encased in two coverings in the subtle body which can be in short called the mind and there's the gross body subtle body is in blue the gross is in red here now this from the soul if you consider the soul to be like a light bulb then just as light emanates from the from a light bulb similarly consciousness emanates from the soul however if we consider say a light bulb uh, the light usually emanates in all directions if we consider it like a flashlight a flashlight normally the light goes in the direction which the flashlight is focused and sometimes some flashlights have various modes so sometimes it's very bright sometimes it's slightly bright sometimes it's just just very it's just a little light and sometimes it's off so we could say the soul is like that flashlight with various states and so if we start from the rightmost you will see the arrow at the bottom which goes out from the subtle body to the gross body to the physical world outside that is the state of jagruti that is the state of awakened consciousness and that is the state in which we all are presently hopefully some of us may have had a long day we might be drowsy or some of us may have had a trouble night and we might be drowsy so then if we are not in the awakened consciousness then we are in a different consciousness and that is so in the awakened consciousness it's just like the flip the flashlight is fully on the beam of light goes a long distance so similarly when we are in the jagruti consciousness in the awakened consciousness the beam of light comes from the subtle body to the gross body and to the physical world outside however when we are asleep then that beam of consciousness doesn't reach the physical body much it reaches primarily the subtle body it does 
reach some awareness is there in the gross body also but not much so that's the time when we are dreaming that is called as swapna consciousness is rooted till the subtle material realm now in the state of swapna or sleep if we see we are still conscious we are not conscious of the physical reality around us but we are conscious of some other some other some other domain of experience wherein we may see various things experience various things and some dreams can be extremely vivid and they are as, they can seem as real as our physical reality and that they can be so real in fact that they can even affect physical reality sometimes we may have a nightmare and we suddenly wake up screaming so and then we find that not only have we screamed out physically but also we might have we might be sweating our breath might be fast we might have dreamt of or maybe a tiger chasing us and we were trying to run away from it or uh, some stalker trying to get to us whatever so the idea here is that there is we are experiencing things in, in the, even in the dream state so from the physical perspective the current state that we are in is the jagruta is the awakened state and when we are at night sleeping that is the sleeping state so the now beyond the sleeping state there is an even deeper state that where the consciousness is practically not rooted anywhere and that is called as sushupti so it is it is barely coming the consciousness is barely coming out of the soul even to the subtle body now this particular classification is given in the upanishads primarily the mundak but otherwise now this is in always any system of taxonomy is indicative it is not exhaustive so for example now where would we be when we are physically unconscious so when we are physically unconscious at that time our consciousness is some is definitely not in the gross body entirely but it is in the subtle body but it's in the transition so in somebody is sleeping and then they are awakened somebody is unconscious and they are brought to consciousness so technically speaking unconsciousness is is not the lack of consciousness unconsciousness is a state of consciousness i repeat this normally we think of unconscious and conscious as opposites so if somebody is unconscious then obviously they are not conscious it's not that simple unconsciousness is the time when consciousness is not manifested at the physical level but unconsciousness is still being manifested at the subtle level so unconsciousness is also a state of consciousness a state of consciousness in which the consciousness is man not manifested at the physical level uh, now when we are in coma that is also a time when we are unconscious and that is the time when the body's consciousness is much more with the consciousness is much more withdrawn from the body and it the body is practically in a vegetative state so that is also a state of consciousness and these are all subtleties and nuances but the point i am making here is that our consciousness moves through different states and whether we are in the first three these three states jagruti swapna or sushupti all these three states are considered the states of spiritual sleep the last state if you see is the consciousness directed uh, directed in the green direction that is the spiritual realm so everything on the other, on the right side in where there is blue and red color this is the material realm so currently our consciousness is directed in the material realm and when the consciousness gets directed to the spiritual realm that is the state of turya now turya is also seen as sometimes known as samadhi and the whole purpose of spiritual growth is to direct our consciousness from matter to spirit in fact we discussed this in the sixth chapter when we talked about yoga yatra uparamate chittam niruddham yoga sevaya 
yoga sevaya by the practice of yoga niruddham so the movement of consciousness in the physical direction or the mental direction basically in the material direction stops and then the consciousness turn inward turn inwards yatra chaiva atmana atmanam pashyan atmani tushyati so then we perceive ourselves as souls and then we perceive the spiritual reality beyond that so now this itself is a fairly intricate analysis of consciousness and we are only having it discussed at the introductory level the purpose of this discussion is just as physical sound awakens us physically spiritual sound awakens us spiritually so what does mantra chanting do it raises our consciousness from the swapna from the jagruti stage to the to the turya stage toward the samadhi that is the purpose of the chanting of mantra that is the purpose of sonic meditation in fact that is the purpose of all of spirit all of spiritual all spiritual practices to direct our consciousness toward the spiritual level so now this is the purpose of mantra chanting now let's see how does this happen so for understanding this it's like if we have technology first we understand what is the purpose of the technology say if if we are given now we have the internet of things say so if we are told okay you have this device and from with this one device in your hand you can control if you have something like google home you can control every single appliance in your home oh really okay and that too you just have to speak you don't even have to physically touch it okay so first understand the purpose of it and then okay this is what it is meant to do then um, to awaken us so then then we manage to okay how does it well where is, how, what is the tool through which it works so is it physically connected to every mac appliance or what is the way of connection so now we will similarly we we'll look at we understand what is the purpose of mantras to awaken our consciousness uh, but where is the power of mantras so traditionally there have been two theories about the power of mantras and they are called as first is called as sphotavad so it is you could say the semantic theory of power of mantra power so semantics means the study of meaning so don't get caught in semantics means don't agonize too much over this meaning or that meaning so sphotavad holds that the power lies in the meaning so so imagine if somebody makes a very intricate sounding argument and uh, so what do you think about this what do you think about this philosophy and suppose somebody says the well, technical name for that philosophy stupid now here what has happened we may laugh at that you know oh, generally when we hear something technical we won't expect a word blunt like stupid uh, so here this is a this is a joke it's a humor now how does humor work humor works when there is sudden cognition it's the awakening the understanding comes like a explosion oh, oh okay that's what it was so when the understanding comes as an explosion in our consciousness and makes us laugh that's what we call as a humorous statement so that's for specifically of humor and is that's for making us laugh but the sphotavad holds that mantras are like say english sentences or any sentences in the language they are now the sentence the power of the sentence is in the meaning and if we consider this was a huge subject in metaphysics we can call it it's often called as the philosophy of language uh, uh, it technically that field is called the philosophy of language and the question comes you know when we talk about words and meaning is is meaning located in the words or is meaning located independent of the word somewhere else in the context in which they are spoken so for example our words just like a pipe so it's a pipeline or it's like a like earlier we used the word package sonic packet 
So are words like a packet which conveys meaning? And we might think that's like, that's how it is. But no, sometimes the same word has different meanings. <clears throat> so sometimes the, when the same word has different meanings, we have to look at the context to understand what it means. But the point is that the, the, it is the meaning that is important. That's the idea of, uh, that the power, power lies in the semantics, in the meaning. That's one theory. That's so all. when you study something, you have to understand it. So for example, when we read a book, especially say a book of English literature or a book of spiritual wisdom like the Bhagavad Gita, we need to understand what is going on. And when we understand, then, oh, that's what it means. Then that's where the illumination comes. That's where the power lies. So that's one theory. That's called Spotavad. The other is called as a Varnavad. Here the idea is the power lies in the patterns. Patterns means the way it is arranged. Varna literally means letters. So Vad in Sanskrit means argument or a theory. So Varnavad is the theory of that the power lies in the letters. And it's independent of meaning. So if this is the idea, in Varnavad the idea is that Mantras are not so much like English sentences as like a math formula. If it's a, if it's a math formula, then the formula works even if you don't know the meaning. Now, if we just know E is equal to mc square and we know where to put what variable, okay, this is the what this is the E that I have, and I, this is the kind of how much mass I am going to convert, then how much energy will I get? I know it. So Many times when formulae are used, it's not necessary that people using the formulae know the whole theory behind it. They may not even exactly know exactly what symbol means what. But you just use the formula and then it works. So is the power of mantras are, uh, like this in the, in the letters itself? So however we chant, as long as we get the letters right, that's all that matters. Or is it while we are getting the sound right, the, at that time we have to meditate and remember the meaning also. So let's look at it now further. So these are two broad theories. Now when we look at the Varanavad theory, it, it has some significant ramifications. So the, the idea of Varanavad makes mantras fearfully powerful. Why fearfully powerful? If, if somebody uses a formula, say for, for releasing a large quantity of energy without knowing it, then that energy might destroy them or destroy something important to them. So with respect to form, formula, if you get the formula, if we, if we actually here we get the formula wrong means we use the formula for a wrong purpose. We get it right, but we use it for a wrong purpose. We don't understand the purpose we are getting it, using it for, we will get a terrible result. So our intent doesn't matter. The meaning doesn't matter over here. This is what I meant to say. So there's a classic example in the Bhagavatam of this, that when a sage was going to perform a, a sage was upset with, was furious in fact, not just upset, Pashta was upset with Indra, enraged because Indra had killed his son, Vishwarupa. And while chanting the mantras, he wanted to use mystic power of mantras to, uh, to create a be being who would kill Indra. Now, the, the, the word Indra Shatroho or Indra Shatru. So, Shatru is, we, the intonation is less. The elongation is less. Shatroho, it's long. So he got the intonation wrong. And because he got that intonation wrong, the result he got was opposite. So one who is the enemy of Indra means that person for who, whom Indra would dread and who, who would ultimately kill Indra. And the other is one whose enemy is Indra. That means that person would eventually be killed by Indra. So Shatro means enemy, but Shatroho and Shatru chanted differently in mantras, 
can have the opposite result and eventually a powerful demon rudrasur was born but unfortunately because the mantra had been chanted wrong so rudrasur instead of killing indra ended up being killed by indra so there are mantras like this which give us access to extraordinary power and if we are not careful that power can work against us uh, so this is now now when i talk about sphotavad and varnavad at uh, generally the sacred texts they are to be approached to sphotavad the sacred texts are say for example the bhagavad gita itself is often recited and reciting the bhagavad gita is considered a sacred activity krishna in the 17th chapter calls it as the austerity of speech it's a way we can purify our speaking simply by reciting the mantras reciting the verses of the gita so the gita verses can also be called as mantras and just reciting them without even knowing their meaning is purifying however if you want the real benefit that real benefit comes in the understanding the meaning and meditating on the meaning and internalizing the meaning so they are mantras but they are uh, their power lies in the meaning there are other mantras which are more for mm, invoking some other power just like these kind of mantras and there the letters are extremely important whether we get the patterns right or not so now here we could say if you want to understand mantra power we can have a mechanical view of it what is this mechanical view that the mantras are like ultra sophisticated voice operated technology just like we have google home now you say okay google turn off my fan okay turn on the fan okay google increase the temperature now we just speak from wherever we are in our home and the temperature increases so this is voice operated technology now what is happening over there that voice is associated with uh, with certain technical or technological levers or buttons or they are triggered by it so similarly mantras activate higher powers or higher phenomena in the universe so this is one view of mantra power as it is voice operated technology but this is a mechanical view by mechanical in the sense that it's mechanics by, by the utterance of the say when i say okay google do this actually the, it's the technological arrangement doesn't doesn't recognize me as a person it just recognizes that sound and understand this sound in this pattern this is what i need to do so this is a, this is a mechanical view and in the mechanical view what the person wanted to say is not important it is what the person said whether the person wanted to say indra shatra ho what did you say indra shatra that's what i will do so this is how uh, this is how things work when there is no conscious understanding it's mechanical understanding now mantra power is there is also a personal view to this so in the personal view man, the power of mantras lies not just in the meaning the meaning matters no doubt it lies not just in the letters the letter matter no doubt but that is neither the meaning nor the letters are the locus of the power the locus of the power is the person whom we are calling and the mercy that that person gives so so for example when we chant the hari krishna mantra we vishla prabhupad would often say that even if you don't know the meaning of the mantra still you chant it and even if you don't get the mantra's pronunciation right in some languages is or in some cultures is difficult for people to pronounce the r sound so halle lam halle lam 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 halle but they may chant like that and still they will experience the presence of krishna they'll experience the reciprocation of krishna they'll experience purification so in this personal view of mantra power the key is that mantras are means by which we access divinity when we access divinity what does it mean now access also has two different meanings to it and we'll come to that a little later that the key here is reciprocity that the divine is a person and as a person that divinity manifests to us 
based on how intensely, how eagerly we approach it. So, so this is the this is talking about Krishna by Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita when he says, Yethamam prapadyante tam sathaiva bajamyaham mamavartamanu vartante manushya partha sarvasha. So the first part is, ye ethamam prapadyante, as people surrender unto me, tam sathaiva bajamyaham, I reward them accordingly. So, while mantras always have power within them, how much that power will be accessible to us will depend on how much earnest emotion, earnest devotional emotion we are investing into the chanting of the mantra. So, so the mantra are reciprocation. Now, here also, then there are degrees of reciprocation depending on the degree of manifestation. So, now he, here, Sometimes most of us have heard this point that Krishna is not different from his name. What does it mean literally? You know, we may say, okay, I'm just uttering the word Krishna. Is Krishna here? Well, he's there, but I may not experience his presence. Why not? Because it's a matter of reciprocity. So Krishna is present in his name, but how much I experience his presence, how much he reveals his presence to me, depends on the mood with which I'm approaching him. And that's why within, within the chanting of mantras, there are different states. There is our acharyas are talking about Nama Parad, Nama Bhas, Shuddha Nam. These are technicalities. And the idea is that it's a function of reciprocity. How much Am I investing myself? Then that much I will get the manifestation of the divine. <clears throat> so here, this it is not a mechanical view at all. It is an extremely personal view. Personal view because it's a person. In the mantra power, the personal view is that say if we sometimes the example is given of how this is not just ordinary sound. Just like we may have ordinary paper and we may have currency. So now, if we have a currency note, say a hundred dollar bill, now it is paper, but at the same time, it is much more than paper. So similarly, mantras are sounds. We utter them with the same tongue as we utter any other sound. But this is spiritual sound. So why is this like that? Because when we talk about the, say, currency note, then the, an authorized agency, the government, has invested that wealth in that currency. So similarly, we could say that in the chanting of mantras, there is that power invested. So although it is, it's both, are, both are produced with the same sound, any ordinary sound as well as a spiritual sound, Spiritual sound, the sound of mantras is different. However, this metaphor of currency can be used to signify how currency is not just paper. Similarly, mantra is not just sound, ordinary sound. But there is a difference with the value of a currency in a sense is independent of the person using it. A hundred dollar bill is hundred dollars. A child may understand its value, a child may not understand its value, but it's still hundred dollars. However, if a child does not understand the value of the hundred dollar bill, the child might go to a go to a toffee shop and the child says, I want toffee. And says, okay, do you have money? Yes. And you go a hundred dollar bill, and if the shop owner is, is cunning or exploitative, you might just give the child. Maybe one toffee, this costs $100. Okay, oh, this I can taste. The child may not understand that it's being swindled. So in one sense, there is an objective aspect to the, uh, to the currency. The currency is $100. But at the same time, there is a subjective aspect to the experience. If somebody doesn't know the value of the currency, then they might, they might give that for something far less valuable. 
so similarly there is an objectivity to the fact that krishna is non different from his name but at the same time there is a subjectivity to our experience of that fact and the subjectivity is because we may not appreciate that value and if we don't appreciate that value then we won't invest our consciousness if we don't invest our consciousness then we won't our consciousness won't be receptive to experience krishna so in this personal view it what is important is not just knowing the meaning of the mantras is not is important not just precisely uttering the mantras they are both important but more important is how much we are investing our consciousness okay now this is the second aspect of our discussion the where is the power of mantras now we will discuss some metaphors so some till now we discussed a metaphor of currency to understand how mantras have power or how mantras are special sound how there is not a special sound there is divinity invested in them but now we will move forward to how does it act on us how does mantra chanting spiritualize us how does it spiritualize our consciousness so earlier you remember the diagram of how the consciousness arises or consciousness goes from swapna or jagruti to or sushupti to samadhi to turya so how does this happen so i'll talk about three metaphors for understanding this an anchor a cleanser and a elevator so the acronym is ace so to understand how mantra chanting works first the repeated utterance of mantras can act like a an anchor for our consciousness so what does the anchor essentially do an anchor stabilizes so if somebody is in an ocean and they're just being tossed here and there by the waves if they could just hold on to an anchor then they will become they they will become stable so similarly we are in the ocean of material existence and we are being tossed by the waves what are those waves the waves of the mind and the waves of the world the the waves of the mind are various kinds of cravings sankalpa and vikalpa i want this i don't want that and the world also gives us heat cold pleasure pain honor dishonor and these waves keep hitting us and tossing us here and there so when we start uttering mantras and we start repeating the mantra if we do it carefully if we do it prayerfully then as our consciousness starts resting holding on to the mantra we could use, when we are chanting mantras we could have that metaphor just as we might physically hold on to an anchor uh, amid the stormy ocean we can imagine that our consciousness is trying to grasp the mantra if we visualize it that way that will give us an impetus for focusing for meditating for concentrating and it will anchor our consciousness so this anchoring will stabilize will pacify will calm us down that's one metaphor that mantras stabilize now i earlier talked about how mantras have special powers but we also mentioned that this is sonic meditation now there are some aspects of uh, the power of power of mantras that may be may be exhibited even by ordinary sound so for example in uh, in today's world in self in the self help world affirmations are quite common so some people when they are disturbed everything will be okay everything will be okay everything will be okay everything will be okay now when they repeat such affirmations they actually feel calm so it's not that affirmations don't work so affirmations work because if we consider that the power of sound is also in its meaning and as we keep repeating a particular particular sound packet here everything will be okay everything will be okay everything will be okay then that everything will be okay can also act as an anchor for our consciousness and when it acts as an anchor it will calm us it will stabilize us 
So there are some effects of mantras that can come by even ordinary sound vibration. Of course, an affirmation is not just an ordinary sound vibration, because it is a sound vibration which has some meaning. And when affir usually when affirmations work, they work to the extent they link with some intuitive truth that we, we believe, but we may forget. So affirmations, there is a lot of psychological study of affirmations done. Affirmations can sometimes even have healing power. But affirmations can sometimes work negatively. Say, for example, if somebody is, is short and they start affirming, I'm tall, I'm tall, I'm tall. You know, that simply causes a cognitive dissonance because we are affirming something which is just not true and we don't, and we don't even believe that it's a universal truth. So affirmations work, they work to the extent they act as reminders of some truth that we accept, but we tend to forget. So that's the anchor level of uh, anchor level. That's one function that mantra chanting does. But mantras do much more. And not all affirmations can do all these things. So mantra also acts as a cleanser. What does a cleanser do? Basically, if by here by cleanser, it's it's not just a fluid, a fluid which cleanses. It's also like a device which brings that fluid that cleanses. So we can have a vacuum cleaner which will just suck in the dirt. Or sometimes if a play, if a floor is dirty, we might pour water on it and then we use a mop to clean it. So basically, it's a mechanism for cleansing. And usually for cleaning, what do we do? We bring in something into the room to be cleaned and that something drags out whatever is unclean. So like that, we could envision mantra to be like a flow of water or a flow of divine energy that comes into our consciousness. Just like a place is unclean, we, we, we say throw a bucket of water over there or we use a pipe to throw water over there. And then we sweep that water away. And along with that, whatever dirt is there on the floor, that also goes away. So mantras are in this sense, both like the pipe and the water that brings the pipe. And then it also flows. So then the mantra flows into our consciousness. It's, it's not just an anchor that pacifies. It's also a cleanser that purifies. So as the mantra comes into our consciousness, it picks up whatever impurities are there and it casts them out. And this will happen to the extent the sound vibration we are connecting with has purificatory potency. So now somebody might say, somebody might have a tendency to overeat and they may decide, I'll make an affirmation. I will not overeat, I will not overeat, I will not overeat, I will not overeat. Or maybe we'll make a positive affirmation also. I will eat only as much as I need. Or it could be before sleeping, somebody makes an affirmation. I'll wake up in the morning. I'll wake up in the morning. I'll wake up in the morning. Now, these kind of affirmations also work to some extent. Now, what happens when such affirmations are there? It is, it is the semantic content registering in our mind. Here, it's not so much. It's the same principle that what we want to do, we are assimilating in our consciousness. But that it only increases our determination. It does not necessarily bring about purification. In an earlier session, we discussed the difference between determination and purification is, determination is where the impurity is still present, but we, by the force of our will, persist in spite of, in spite of the impurity. So for example, I will wake up in the morning, I'll wake up in the morning, I'll wake up in the morning. So then whatever the lethargy is there, Whatever the laziness is there, it is there, but by, by, by my will, I overpower it. And that's good. However, that is itself not purification. Purification means the impurity itself goes in. So then, the unwanted, the, the laziness or the unwanted craving for too much food, that itself goes away. So, mantra chanting is... Externally speaking, it can have the same effect as the affirmation has, 
but internally it's a doing a different thing it is not just boosting our determination it is actually bringing about purification determination means it is willpower in the presence of the impurity purification is just the elimination of the impurity so that's what mantra chanting does that is it cleanses and the last example is it's an elevator for our consciousness elevator means now earlier you saw the metaphor of the three levels of consciousness or the the four le uh, four levels as horizontal but if you made it vertical so swapna jagrata sushipti are on the lower side and turiya is on the opposite side so we could say material consciousness is at a lower level spiritual consciousness at a higher level so the mantra chanting elevates the consciousness it if we enter into an elevator if we just stay in the elevator the elevator will take us up similarly if we just chant the mantras and let our consciousness dwell in the mantras so in a sense when we are chanting the mantra we are taking the consciousness in uh, taking the mantra in our consciousness but if we understand that the mantra is not different from krishna then it is not just we are taking krishna in krishna is taking us in krishna is manifesting as the holy name and is taking our consciousness into him and if we just let our consciousness enter into krishna that's like entering into elevator and as we enter into the elevator the consciousness start rising up 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 and in this way the repeated chanting of the mantras can elevate our consciousness to the spiritual level so these are three metaphors for understanding how the conscious how mantras spiritualize our consciousness and this elevation effect will not come by any affirmation this will come only when the mantra itself is sacred the mantra itself is evoking or manifesting divinity and then it elevates our consciousness so then to summarize this how do, what does mantra chanting provide us it provides us three things peace purity and pleasure so the anchoring aspect of mantra chanting it brings us peace it stabilizes us the cleansing aspect of mantra chanting it brings purity and the elevating aspect see the material domain of reality we may seek pleasure but it is the material domain is a domain of paucity and mortality paucity means that whatever we want for enjoyment it is never enough we, we even if we want delicious food to eat we can't we can't have all the delicious food that we want even if we have all those foods our bodies don't have the capacity to all, eat all those foods so it is a domain of paucity of shortage and it is domain of mortality because everything is temporary is going to end so lasting pleasure is found not by getting desirable things at the material level but by raising our consciousness to the spiritual level so that is the pleasure that is the so when our consciousness rises to the level of krishna that is spiritual level where krishna is present then we experience great pleasure so for us curiously when we chant uh, the mantras we may or may not experience any of these immediately because the mind is very restless sometimes our mantra chanting will give us peace sometimes it will give us pleasure but in the, even if it gives us neither peace nor pleasure why might it not give us pleasure sometimes because our consciousness is not yet ascended to the spiritual level why might it not give us peace because maybe our mind is too restless because the situations around us are too turbulent but still the purity in the sense of pu purity we could say is a state purification is the process purity is the fruit purification is the process so purification is always happening so if we try to rate the effectiveness of our chanting by how much peace we experience or how much pleasure we experience we may sometimes feel is this serving any purpose at all but these are things not in our control it's like we might try to hold on to an anchor but if it's the stormy waves are very strong then the effort in holding on to the anchor far exceeds or at least in our experience the effort to hold on to the anchor 
we hold it and then we lose the grip and we hold it again and we lose the grip the effort might seem far more than any stability we might get however so the peace may not be experienced and pleasure may not be experienced because our consciousness may not be going to spiritual level but the purification will be experienced because just letting the mantra come in our consciousness means that it's like a flow of clean sparkling water coming in everything unclean is getting washed away so purification is what we can seek steadily and if we seek purification steadily it will act like a medication the traditional metaphor that is given is that if somebody has got jaundice and they take sugar cane juice as medicine that is the recommended medicine in ayurveda but they they may not taste sugar cane juice as sweet but its effect will be there they will be getting cured and as they get get cured more and more then they will start tasting it so similarly the peace and the pleasure we will experience but not immediately so we we chant the mantras for purification that means you take it as a medication even if it doesn't taste good normally when we we take a medicine it's not so much for the taste as for the effect so similarly the taste of mantra chanting we might get in terms of peace or we might get in terms of pleasure but we chant mantra not just although these are effects we don't chant primarily for these at our level we chant for purification for the effect of the cleansing of our heart and here also we want to not just use the mantra as a tool for our purification we want to actually reciprocate with krishna we want to offer our consciousness to krishna so when when the mantra is being chanted the idea is krishna is manifesting as the sound and we give ourselves to krishna through the sound through the medium of the sound and krishna will give himself to us and that is the ultimate exchange of love that happens through the chanting of the mantras so we try to concentrate and invest our consciousness in the recitation of the mantra in the uttering of the mantra and as we offer our consciousness in the reciprocation the divine manifests and there is our consciousness coming and there is the divine coming and both of them so we and krishna meet each other in the mantra and in that meeting of the in meeting in the mantra is life's supreme fulfillment so i'll summarize what i spoke today and then we can have some questions so i spoke today on the topic of mantra chanting we discussed broadly three main points so how does mantra chanting awaken us so i talked about how mantras are sonic power or other spiritual power in case in sound or they are packets of uh, sonic packets of divine energy and just as a sleeping person is awakened by physical sound those who are spiritually asleep are awakened by spiritual sound so oh, we discussed the four levels of consciousness so, so the current state wakeful state is jagruti where the consciousness comes from the soul through the subtle matter to to the gross matter and to the physical world so then swapna is where it comes only to the mental realm to the subtle level not so much to the physical level and sushupti is where it stays within itself so it's the soul is like a torch we could come where with the, the beam going to different distances depending on the strength of the beam and <clears throat> Uh, beyond all these is the turya the samadhi stage where the consciousness goes in the spiritual direction and <clears throat> mantra chanting uh, is meant to awaken us so we are as, as long as we are caught in material consciousness we are asleep spiritually and mantra chanting brings our consciousness to the spiritual level now where is the power of the mantras we discussed two theories sphotavad is mantras are like sentences with semantic content so the power lies in the meaning like in a joke it's only when we understand the statement then we laugh so that's one theory where the focus is on the proper comprehension of what 
is what the sound means. The second theory is Varnavad, where the focus is on just the uh, patterns. As long as the letters are arranged right, the sounds are uh, pronounced right, then there is the power over there. So that is this treats this uh, the mantra to be like a formula. And uh, as long as you get the formula right, that's all that matters. Now, if somebody uses a formula slightly wrongly, A is equal to MC square, if they make it MC cube, the result can be completely wrong. So like that Indra Shatroho, instead of that, instead of that somebody said Indra Shatro, the effect can be completely opposite. So in this vision, mantras are, we could say fearfully powerful because they can be grievously misused intentionally or unintentionally. And this is a mechanical view of mantra power where we see it as a sophistic, ultra sophisticated sound operated technology, voice operated technology. Then a more personal view is, is that within the Bhakti tradition, we accept both Sportavad and Varnavad, but we don't accept them as the full reality. It is that the divine is manifesting through the sound. So we, 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 as much as possible, we understand the meaning of the mantra. As much as possible, we pronounce the words right. But the most important is we invest our consciousness. And then when we offer our heart to Krishna, then Krishna manifests. So the key power of the mantra is in the mercy of the divine coming through the mantra. And just as the currency is different from ordinary paper, similarly mantra is different from ordinary sound. And the currency's value is objective. Say it's hundred dollars. It is hundred dollars, but it's subjective in the sense that a child who doesn't know its value might give hundred dollars for just one toffee. So similarly, uh, mantras are non-different from Krishna as objective truth. But in our subjective experience, the, the mantra might seem just like an ordinary sound because we may not be investing our consciousness sufficiently. So that's why the more we invest our consciousness, the more we experience the power of mantras. And then last part we discuss how do mantras work in spiritualizing a consciousness? We discuss three metaphors, anchor, cleanser, and elevator. So as an anchor, uh, just like in a storm, anchor stabilizes a person. Similarly, mantra chanting stabilizes our consciousness. So now this purpose may be served even by affirmations, which can calm and stabilize the mind. Then cleanser is where, when you want to clean a room, we bring a flow of water into it and water carries away the, the dirt from it. So similarly, in our consciousness, we bring in the flow of mantra and all the unhealthy cravings that are there, any, all impurities that are there, they will get swept away, washed away. So affirmations can also seem to cleanse, but what affirmations do is they, they may boost our determination. They don't bring about purification. Uh, but mantra chanting, it actually brings about purification, cleanses the heart, and then it elevates our consciousness. So when we recite the mantra, we are letting Krishna as the sound come in, but Krishna is far bigger than us. So it is we who are going into Krishna, going to the sound of Krishna is manifesting as a sound. So if we enter the elevator, the elevator will take us up. So similarly, if we offer our consciousness to Krishna through sound, then Krishna will elevate us. And this elevating aspect of, of Mantra chanting is not possible, is not attainable through any affirmation. So uh, affirmations also tap the power of sound. They tap primarily the semantic power of sound, uh, but they importantly cannot do uh, much of what mantras can do. They can't spiritualize our consciousness. They can't take us to the divine. And to the extent we absorb our consciousness in Krishna, rather offer our consciousness to Krishna through the sound of the mantras, in the mantra, there will be a meeting of us and Krishna. And that is life's supreme fulfillment. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. So is our experience in the material world a dream or is it like a dream? So 
when we are dreaming while in the material world are we accessing a different dimension is our consciousness moving to a different realm or um, are our experiences um, simply concoctions of the mind that just seem very real well there are two different there are two different questions now so a lot depends on what do we mean by the word dream baldev vidya bhushan in his govinda bhashya commentary on the vedanta sutra in words our normal understanding so sometimes we use the word dream to convey unreality he says that's just a dream that person is a day dreamer so so he conveys the idea that rather than considering when we say the world is like a dream is it like a dream so we the we might use it to convey that the world is unreal as dreams are unreal but he takes the same metaphor and says we say the world is like a dream what it means is just as the world is real the dreams are also real but just as dreams are temporary reality the world we experience is also temporary reality so the idea is that for all practical purposes where our consciousness is that is where we are so if we are in a movie theater watching a action movie where the hero is being chased by a monster and is desperately running for life and we are experiencing the panic and the horror and the thrill of it all then we are in that movie we are physically on a chair in the movie theater but we are in that movie so the soul soul's existence is experienced through consciousness and there is no experience of either self existence or existence of anything else independent of consciousness and that's why wherever the consciousness is that's where we are so in that sense whether it is like a dream or a dream doesn't matter so is the soul in the material world or is the soul in the spiritual world dreaming that this i am in the material world that that differs it doesn't matter for us so because where the consciousness is that's where we are and when we talk about transmigration well for all practical purposes the soul goes from one body to another body so what is happening it is we experience life in the new body completely different from the way we are experiencing it in the previous body so 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 when so whether the soul itself is uh, is experiencing matter is in the world of matter or soul is simply experiencing the world of matter it doesn't make any difference so there is of course the idea that the soul is in the material world and the soul has to go to the spiritual world so the literal understanding is quite often used when you talk about going to the spiritual world but the spiritual world also is a domain of consciousness so it's not simply like a physical travel and a physical reality so i metaphors have their limitations and we can't uh, for subtler areas of reality physical metaphors metaphors drawn from physical reality have some utility but say a metaphor you could say is like a rubber band when we want to hold on to some keep a object together we might put a rubber band around it and we might if you want to pick it up we pick up the rubber band and that object it may might get picked up but the rubber band is not the object and similarly every metaphor is like a rubber band and the it, the metaphor gives us some grip on the object uh, but if we stretch the rubber band too much it will break So similarly, if you stretch a metaphor too much, it will break. Now the other point that when we are dreaming, are we going to some other domain? It's possible, but it's not necessary. So sometimes it's just imagination, where the soul is still in the body, and I would say most of the times it's like that. The soul is still in the in the body, and the soul is uh, just visualizing or imagining various things. so some dreams are for example just random concatenations of different stimuli we might have seen gold we might have seen mount seen a mountain in our dream we might see a golden mountain 
So two stimuli are brought together in, by the imagination of the mind. And however, there are some times when there are paranormal sightings or paranormal experiences where people perceive that they have gone out of the body and they gain some factual knowledge of oh, this person, this happened to that person or this person did that. So in those cases, there could be some kind of the soul temporarily leaving the body. That is possible. It is possible, for example, in out of body experiences when the when a when a person sees themselves from above, say the operating theater, especially it happens during cardiac arrest patient, cardiac arrest, that people they have a out of body experience. So sometimes during dreams that can happen, but again for practical purposes, all that we can know is we can verify the factuality of a dream. So if we had some factual if we get some factual information in a dream, then we could reasonably hypothesize that okay the soul left the body and at least the consciousness or projected or transmitted to that level that place and uh, that's how we were able to know that thing otherwise usually it's just imagination but saying just imagination doesn't is not meant to devalue the point because for us when we experience it is as real as any other thing and sometimes the dreams can have even physical consequences. Are the mind and consciousness present beyond the body? Otherwise, how are we aware of our surroundings but not of our inner bodies? Yes. There are three levels. There's the, there is the soul, which is like a torch light. Then the subtle body, which is primarily the mind. The mind is, we could say, like the window now it's this is not just a simple window you could say it's more like a screen we have discussed this elaborately in our topic topic on mind on managing the mind in the sixth chapter that the mind is like a screen uh, now it's it's not just a screen where we perceive but it's a screen on which we also act and things get transmitted so it's both like a window and a screen so the Mind is here and then the body is the third thing. So consciousness and mind, are they different from the body? Of course, yes, the body is the physical level of reality. The mind is the subtle or psychological level of reality. The soul is at the spiritual level and consciousness is like the beam of light coming from the spiritual level. So this consciousness moves outward and because the consciousness moves outward, we see when a flashlight is directed in a particular direction, that's what we see. Now through introspection, we can become aware of our mind and sometimes we can become conscious. Oh, okay. Now this thought, sometimes we might just get angry and then that means we get carried away by that thought. So we are not conscious of the thought. The thought has taken over our consciousness, but sometimes, okay, I'm getting angry now, better let me end this conversation. Uh, otherwise I might explode, I might speak something that I might regret. So in that case, what has happened? If we are a little more observant, we can observe the content of our mind also. Uh, we can observe the content of our mind before that becomes the sole content of our mind and it takes us over, takes over our mind. So that way we can observe our mind, but we can't observe the soul. We can't observe the consciousness itself because it is only when we are purified completely that this inner screen will become like a mirror. And when it becomes like a mirror, that's when we'll be able to see our, ourselves internally. Yes, if we can't chant the mantra properly, the, having the right intent is okay. Yes, that's what I said. The primary focus is in the utterance, is the intention with which the mantra is chanted. At the same time, we shouldn't intentionally or carelessly mispronounce. We try as much as possible to pronounce properly, but if you're not able to pronounce, we don't have to be paranoid about that. We have to focus on trying to cultivate a devotional mood and then try as much as possible to pronounce properly. Does the purification effect of the mantra chanting depend on the quality 
or is it independent it depends on the quality of course it's it's i took the metaphor of say if you want to clean a room and then we have a powerful say hose which brings in water now that hose has to be focused on the area to be cleaned now if the water is going everywhere else but not into that room then it's not going to clean that room so similarly the mantra chanting the mantra has to enter our consciousness so if for example we are not attentive at all when we are chanting mantras then then the purification will be marginal it's like we have the hose in our hands and we are just moving our hands randomly here and there maybe a little water is going into that room where we want to clean it and that what much water will clean so but so similarly if we are not attentive in our chanting then then the purification will not be much of course rather than getting discouraged by thinking oh if i i chant, being attentive is so difficult and therefore how can i get purified instead of that we can think of it in a different way that if we chant mantras and we have if uh, those of us who are practicing bhakti are chanting mantras we all have experienced some purification and we can think that although my chanting is inattentive still i have experienced some purification so that means how powerfully purifying the mantra must be that even with my inattentive distracted chanting i am experiencing purification if i try to become more attentive how much purer i will become so that way we can have a positive attitude towards the chanting of the mantras so another way to understand this is that say sometimes when there are riots the police might shoot in the air now when the police shoot in the air that might also cause the rioters to dissipate dissipate but then the police go away the rioters will come back mm. however if the now of course if the rioters are very violent then the police may have to shoot at the rioters they may use a stun they may use a stunner to stun them they may shoot at their legs or whatever they might they have to shoot them now if the rioters are shot and they are immobilized then they are not going to come back so we can say our mantra chanting is like shooting bullets with a gun so even if the bullets are being simply shot in the air still just by that also some of the rioting impurities within our consciousness will go away but they'll go away temporarily because they have not been eliminated it is if, if there is uh, and uh, these uh, anti social elements whoever are they uh, uh-huh, if they have so those are impurities like that so when our mantra chanting is attentive it's concentrated then it's like the impurities are being removed from the root but both ways the purific the uh, the purification is happening in some cases it is temporary in some cases it will be more enduring and that will depend on how focused we are in our chanting does the mantra chanting work just by hearing yes for some people who can't speak the mercy is not inaccessible krishna always makes himself accessible so even in the tradition also there is the chanting of mantras in the mind that is called manasik there are manasik upankshu and vachika manasik in the mind upankshu is soft whispering and vachika is aloud so a manasik chanting is also very potent but uh, it is normally very difficult to focus on that kind of chanting and that's why as devotees we chant louder chant uh, chant at least softly if not allowed uh, because that involves more of our senses in the folk process of chanting uh, having said that if some for somebody it's physically not possible to chant then krishna won't make themselves inax- make it not very won't make himself inaccessible mm-hmm. okay are all mantras equally powerful yes this is an important question are all mantras equally powerful is there a difference between different names chanted so if one chants the names of god from some other religious tradition 
will that elevate us as lord chaitanya says that all names are equal okay this is important first there are two different things there is there is mantra and there is nama so manam is or hari nam as we say it is the holy name of the lord now all mantras are not necessarily hari nam or even the nam of anyone some mantras might be invoking some form of divinity other than krishna some mantras might not be invoking any divinity at all so it also the are all mantras powerful yes are all of them equally powerful no definitely not it depends on what is the mantra about what who is being invoked by that mantra so if the supreme divinity is being invoked by a mantra uh, that naturally the supreme divinity is far more powerful than any of the say the devatas some we could say intermediate divinities so who is being invoked by a particular mantra is important and uh, So, so the port, so that's one factor which will determine the power of the mantras. Now, if you focus specifically on the names which are being chanted, so is there a difference? Yes and no. No, in the sense that any any authentic name of the Lord can manifest His presence, and in that sense, one can experience God. One can experience the divine. At the same time. different names are associated with different aspects of the divine so bhakti no thakur talks about primary names and secondary names of krishna so he says primary names are those which refer to krishna's self existence so krishna's self existence is in the spiritual world where he performs pastimes with his devotees and say for example yashoda nandan rohini nandan rashoda nandan nanda nandan gopi janavallabha gopal these are names of krishna associated with his pastimes directly and then there are names of krishna which are associated with his role in the material world so for example annadata the provider of food vishwanath the master of the universe or vishvakarta the creator uh, the the creator of the universe now these are all names which are secondary secondary means that they are more associated with god's function in the world not his self existence so he says the the although all mantra all mantras involving the names of the lord or all names of the lord will purify us they will elevate our consciousness but each name has a particular flavor a particular mood so the secondary names of god are being associated with his role in the world will in in who that kind of remembrance within us and the primary names of krishna will evoke remembrance of his if his personal attributes in his abode so in that sense for evoking remembrance of krishna and for linking us with the more personal aspects of krishna the names that are connected with his personal aspects are more potent so the names themselves have the potency of krishna but the names also invoke certain memories and what memories they invoke varies in that sense we could say there is unity in diversity or rather there is diversity in unity that unity all names of the lord are sacred all names of the divine will elevate us so that's unity and that's what is the mood of nam nam akari bahuda nijas sarva shaktis that in the shikshashtakam or lord chaitanya he says all my energy is invested in these mantras at the same time there is also the uh, particular remembrance that is invoked and that that that's how differentiate between the primary and the secondary names if krishna is non different from his name does that mean the name also have a form now it depends on what you are trying to what we are trying how we understand the idea of non difference also if we consider that primarily what we are doing is we are trying to focus on connecting our consciousness with krishna through the uttering of mantras so is the dt non different from krishna for example another idea of non difference yes the dt is non different from krishna 
at the same time, in that particular manifestation, when Krishna comes as the deity, you now he is manifesting to give us an opportunity to, to serve him. So the deity doesn't dress himself. We dress the deity. The, we, the deity doesn't deco uh, decorate himself. We decorate the deity. So why? Because that manifestation is for a particular purpose. A devotee can experience Krishna fully through the deity or as the deity. At the same time, the deity is not meant to manifest Krishna's omnipotence. That is not the purpose of that manifestation. So that's why sometimes uh, some invaders might come, some marauders, iconoclasts might come, and they might desecrate the deity. And that's what happened in India during the Islamic invasion. That's what happened in Goa during the Catholic Inquisition of Goa. So many temples were destroyed. And the deities are also destroyed. Now we may say, if the deity is not different from Krishna, how can the deity be damaged? See, the point, Krishna is not manifesting as the deity to demonstrate his omnipotence. Krishna is manifesting to give us an opportunity to reciprocate with him by offering him, by, by offering our service to him through our eyes, by beholding him, through our hands, by dressing him, and various ways like that. So every manifestation has a particular purpose. And when we approach that manifestation for that purpose, we can experience the divine fully through that manifestation. But we may not experience the omnipotence of the divine over there. So similarly, does the mantra have a form? It depends on what we're talking about. That if we say the mantra is non-different from Krishna, then it is Krishna's form that is revealed to a devotee through the mantra. Is the mantra having some separate, some other separate form? Yes, if you're going to write down the mantra, then we have, there's a particular form depending on which language we write it in. Uh, that is the enunciated or the, the script. Uh, so, so the mantra is meant to manifest Krishna through sound. So does the mantra itself have the form of Shamsundar Krishna? Yes, a devotee will experience it that way. But the mantra is not having some form separate from it because it's sound. Sound form is associated, it's another tanmatra, it's a different sense object. Sound is a different sense object. So now some devotees may, may in the mood of devotion say that if we don't utter the mantra properly, if we mispronounce, then it is like if Krishna is non-different from his name and the name is like the deity. So in that sense, Krishna's name is like the deity. And if you're mispronouncing, we are, we are breaking a part of the deity. Well, that's, that's just a meditation to inspire us to pronounce clearly. It's not that Krishna is going, uh, going to see it as a, you know, breaking a deity is a severe offense. It's not that Krishna is going to treat it as a severe offense if we mispronounce the mantra. But we do want to pronounce the mantra properly. So in certain contexts, we could say the mantra has a form, but the non-difference is for a particular purpose. The non-difference is for helping us access the divine through sound. Okay. How do we avoid the mechanical chanting of mantras? It is by giving ourselves some other resources for concentrating. There's a point of concentration and there's a circle of concentration. So if we can't focus on the sound of the holy name, try to have something related with the holy name. Maybe a picture of Krishna, maybe a, a, a picture of... Um, picture of our favorite pastime, not just a favorite deities, but a favorite pastime. And remember that just as the devotee called out to Krishna at that time, I am calling out to Krishna now. Or if we are not so much of a visual person, if we are more verbal, our verbal intelligence is high, then we could keep some quote about the holy name, some mantra or some quote. And whenever the mind starts wandering, read that and contemplate that. So basically when the mind wanders, instead of letting it wander all over the universe, give it a circle in which it can wander. And then it wanders within that circle and it comes back. It wanders, it comes back. So that way, we can invest some emotion into the chanting. Now, does a break in chanting affect the form of the mantra? Not at all. It depends on the mood in which we are chanting. And sometimes taking a break helps us to concentrate better and call out with greater devotion. Actually, Krishna will be manifested more by that. So thank you very much for your attention and participation. Hare Krishna.